Call me naive, but I thought Milo Minderbinder was a fictional character. Do you remember the mess officer in Catch-22 who bombs his own base because the Germans are paying a higher price? Milo is alive and well in Riyadh. Saudi Arabia is bombing the Houthis, the same country who encouraged them to revolt. The United Arab Emirates provided the second largest contingent of planes, the same Emiratis, who arranged secret meetings in Rome between an ousted Yemeni autocrat's son and the Iranians. The meeting was bugged by the Americans, who are the allies of Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Yemen, and possibly also Iran too. Are you confused? You will become so in the next 10 minutes. The Guardian's Seamus Milne sees this as evidence of the US playing one side off against the other. Far from pulling out of the Middle East, Milne notes, interventions are multiplying. Obama has bombed seven Muslim countries since he became president. There are now four full-scale wars raging, and arms sales to the Gulf under Obama have exceeded those racked up by Bush. What has changed is that in true imperial fashion, the West's alliances have become more contradictory, playing off one side against the other. In Yemen, it is supporting the Sunni powers against Iran's Shia allies. In Iraq, it is the opposite. The US and its friends are giving air support to Iranian-backed Shia militias fighting Sunni Takfiri group ISIS. In Syria, they are bombing one part of the armed opposition while arming and training another. All true, except that the US are not the only dirty players in Yemen. Let's start with Ali Abdullah Saleh, the ousted Yemeni dictator who never seems to go away. He was the man against whom the democratic revolt of the Arab Spring in Yemen was aimed. Chain square meant first and foremost changing him. A strong man ousted in 2012, as the Washington Post described him somewhat gently. In the course of suppressing the revolution, Saleh was nearly killed in a bomb attack. He was taken to Riyadh with 40% burns, but survived thanks to Saudi doctors. Saleh returned and secured a key concession, immunity from prosecution, and the promise he could stay on as leader of Yemen's biggest party. The revolutionary forces agreed to this and they now recognize it was the biggest mistake they made. Now Saleh has changed sides again. He's backing the Houthis, helping to propel the rebel advance, as the Wall Street Journal reports. However, the academic and Saudi exile Madawi al-Rashid notes in an article for Al Monitor, in 2009, it was the other way around. Saleh was attacking the Houthis, helped on by Saudi jets. As I reported, in the Huffington Post, the plan which had so intrigued the small clique of advisers around the former Saudi King Abdullah and the Emiratis was to use the Houthis as a lever to depose the serving Yemeni president, Abd Rabu Mansur Hadi, and to install Saleh's son, Ahmed. Ahmed had been the head of Yemen's National Guard and was at the time Yemen's ambassador to the UAE. He took part in a secret meeting in Rome with the Iranians. The plan went wrong, all plans do in Yemen. The Houthis took more ground than they were expected to and more quickly. Seeing that elite units of the Yemeni army were working hand in glove with the Houthis, Islah did not fight and Aden was in danger of falling. Worse, the old king died and his group of advisers were ousted in what became a palace coup in all but name. The gun had been fired but the men who pulled the trigger were no longer in power. The new King Salman was furious with Saleh's betrayal. The Saleh clan continued to double deal. Two days before the bombing began, the Saudis revealed that Ahmed offered to change sides and bring with him 100,000 troops. Salman's son, Mohammed, refused. Foreign Policy magazine reports it as Saudi's big gamble. With a new king and a young, untested defence minister, Riyadh has plunged headlong into war in Yemen. So let's be clear. The Saudi air campaign is not the first regional intervention in Yemen. It's the second one. Enter the third power to make the life of Yemenis a misery, Iran. Iran made little secret of its support for the Houthis. 
officials at all levels of the Iranian state were quick to claim the Houthis take over as Iran's. As Al Arabi reports, Iran is backing Yemen's Houthis for now. The well-connected Iranian MP Ali Reza Zakani called events in Yemen a natural extension of the Iranian revolution and 14 out of 20 Yemeni governorates will soon be under Houthi control. Zakani bragged that three Arab capitals were in Iranian hands, by which he meant Beirut, Baghdad and Damascus, and Sana was now the fourth. The Iranian website Digraban quoted Zaad al-Din Zareh, a member of the political administration inside the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, as saying that whispering is getting louder and louder about the presence of the Revolutionary Guard inside the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. These were direct threats to Riyadh itself. The Houthis were modelled on and trained by Hezbollah. That much is admitted by Nasrallah himself in a recent speech when he said cryptically, we knew them later. Hezbollah provided the training, Iran the arms and the money. Hezbollah operatives have been caught and expelled from Yemen before. Just in case there is any doubt about how active the links are between the Houthis, Iran and Hezbollah, a Houthi spiritual leader, Abdel Malik al-Shami, was wounded in the Islamic State attack on the Al-Hajush Mosque in Sana'a. He died of his injuries in Tehran and he was buried in a graveyard in South Beirut. Abdul Malik al Houthi, the 33 year old leader of the Houthis, is, his followers say, the descendant of God and his march is Quranic. The blood of thousands of Yemenis was spilt by terrorism and assassination. This terror is being multiplied in those houses of Quran and the Hadith. So don't blame him for what he does in his path. Thus, we have the final ingredient of this poisonous brew, sectarianism. Until today, Yemen was relatively free of it. The Zaydis were unlike other Shia sects. They believed in five imams as opposed to 12, and theologically they were as close to the Sunnis as they were to Shia. The Zaydis are well represented in the power structures. There are Zaydis in the leadership of Islam. Zaydis at the head of the armed forces, Zaydis as the leader of parliament. Salah himself is a Zaydi. Yemen does not divide easily between Sunni and Shia. So when the Houthis attack Salafi mosques, replacing Sunni preachers with their own, before the Saudi airstrikes, they introduced a sectarian motive for their actions, out of keeping with their moderate religious practice. As the Middle East Eye reported, Yemen's president accuses Houthi militia of importing Tehran's ideology to divide long coexisting Shiites and Sunnis in Yemen. The Saudi coalition is sectarian too, explicitly formed in the name of protecting Sunnis. Riyadh's intervention in Yemen has been accompanied by state-sanctioned rhetoric. The Saudi prince responsible for the eastern province, where the bulk of the Saudi Shia population live, said there was evil filth in the Shia community after the killing of two police officers in the provincial capital, Dammam. So what do we end up with? A revolution in the name of the Yemeni people? No. A restoration of autocracy? Not yet. A new Iranian imamate? Instead of all these, we have a classic proxy war from which no side can extricate itself easily. Iran is digging in for a long war. So too is Saudi Arabia. The war is being run by Salman's son, Mohammed. It's his first operation as defense minister and he cannot be seen to fail. For the US academic John Wills, Operation Decisive Storm is reminiscent of previous proxy wars in Yemen, as he reported for the Middle East Research and Information Project. For those with longer historical memories, this military campaign suggests a previous proxy war between Gamal Abdel Nasser's Egypt and Saudi Arabia, when both countries intervened in the Yemeni civil war, 1962 to 1967, to support the Yemeni Republicans on the one hand and the Yemeni monarchy on the other. In that conflict, the Saudis backed the deposed Zaidi Imam, 
while Egyptian troops fought on the other side of the free officers. Although the Republican officers prevailed, Egypt suffered a kind of defeat, and Saudi Arabia ultimately extended its hegemony over what was then North Yemen. In fact, Egypt lost anywhere between 22,000 and 30,000 troops, a human loss no one in Cairo forgets. Is a prolonged war in Yemen what either Saudi Arabia or Iran needs? Certainly not Saudi Arabia. The longer the air campaign continues, the more the mood of Yemenis will turn against them. For Iran, there is another calculation. Everyone was surprised by the Saudi decision to launch the air campaign, not least Tehran. But once launched, Iran may calculate that Saudi Arabia will become embroiled in Yemen. It will thus be in less of a position to counter Iran's strategic aims in Syria and Iraq, which is to establish a defensive hinterland. It's all been a great game, except for Yemen itself.